Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Laying It Out. I'm your host, Scotty Dempsey. And I'm Chelsea Pockets. And today we're sitting down with a friend of the pod, a licensed mental health counselor who specializes in (laughs) athletic performance and mental performance and talk about all the mental health challenges that are involved in being a competitive athlete, as I'm sure all of us that play Frisbee know, especially in college. Yeah, uh, it was a really fun conversation to have. Uh, Scotty and I were joking before we sat down with him. Oh, let's let's not make this a therapy session for ourselves. But I do think it was like a really good conversation. And this is a topic that you and I have wanted to talk about since we got the podcast. Uh, yeah. Kind of getting it out there. So I'm really excited for this one. And I'm really excited for you guys to hear. It. It's a fantastic interview. And you know, we just love every episode we every episode we put out. So we love this one too. <laughs> yeah. Um, for any of you watching on YouTube, you'll notice my background as I move to the side. Sorry, <laughs> audio only listeners, you're missing out. I have moved. I am now in a new house, not an apartment. And it's actually very timely for our discussion on mental health because before during the pandemic i was in a new city uh living by myself isolated with my cat which as you can probably imagine was not great for my mental health but now i'm living with friends uh we're in like a smaller city that i'm not gonna name so i (laughs) i'm still outside of philly outside of philly Um, but i'm in walking distance like a few days ago, I walked to CVS and I picked up lunch on the way back. I love walking places, environmentally friendly. Um, but yeah, because of that, I am in my bedroom now because I live with other people and I can't just take up a common space and record. I know that's what you do. No shade to you, but you live in a New York City apartment, so you a can't really record in your yeah. bedroom. <laughs> Yeah, but like, you know, um, during the during the work day, my roommate's busy too, so we can just sit down, pop this out, you know, in an hour. We're all good. Yeah. But yeah, the reason I'm bringing that up is because my walls are very blank. I basically just have my Captain America pillow and then my cow pillow, because those <laughs> are two of my personality traits. <laughs> and then I just shoved, I didn't even hang up the blackout curtain, because I don't have a way to hang it up yet. I just shoved it into the cracks of the window. <laughs> to block out the sun um true gremlin status so yeah Uh, Yeah. right below me you can't see right out of screen are the boxes i still haven't unpacked so yes um but this all relates to the topic and it relates to our ps zone topic where we're going to be talking about how like a clean space and a nicely decorated space is really good for your mental health um, cause that's something I don't have right now. <laughs> All right. Well, and also in other news, I think I'm injured. Um, <laughs> it is brutal out here taking care of myself as a, you know, no longer college student that can bounce back from anything. Also, I'm not in shape anymore. We're 23. Yeah, I know. Old, old lady over here, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> we're, we're working through it. We're getting through it, you know, just figuring out how Frisbee can be a part of my life now that I have graduated college. And once again, definitely something that uh, was great to talk about with Powell, our guest. So, you know, to some degree, this interview did turn a little bit into Scotty and Pockets talking about their problems, but not really. And I'm <laughs> sure that like everyone can relate to a degree as well. It's just really nice to know that you're not alone in whatever you're dealing with. But yeah, we don't want to waste any more time getting to the interview. So we'll take a quick break and we will be right back. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, Today we are sitting down with Powell Coachella, a licensed mental health counselor specializing in performance psychology. He played D1 soccer at UMBC and now dabbles in the world of disc golf. And we wanted to sit down and talk to him today because the country's starting to open up and we wanted to touch on the various mental health topics that may affect the Frisbee community and athletes as a whole about whether you return to play, choose not to, dealing with injuries and any um, mental health blocks that may come with that. 
So to start off, uh, thanks for joining us, pal. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. Um, before we get into some of like the deeper questions, I was really interested when we were doing our pre-interview. How did you find disc golf? Yeah, so you know it's funny. I I haven't told this story in a long time, but uh, I uh, found a disc, and you know it was a driver, uh, and those drivers are meant to be thrown a certain way. But I had only been um, I've been th- throwing frisbees for a while, and I love frisbee. Uh, but it's different, certainly a different technique and tactic to throwing a driver. And so I was trying to throw it like a frisbee, and it kept, you know, kept uh, like hising left, and it and it was darting left, and it happened so often. I'm like, what is going on here? And even if I threw it pretty hard, it was going left. I'm like, this frisbee must be messed up. So, uh, but then someone <laughs> saw me doing it, and they said, oh, you got to throw it like this. And then it was pretty much after I threw. You know, with a driver, I threw a, a really long drive and saw what a disc was capable of doing. Uh, and I was hooked for my then. And I've been playing ever since. I love the sport. That's how it gets you. I love yeah. that. Yeah. 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 I hear a lot of people fall in love with just disc sports in general, just watching it fly. So that's that's really cool. I like that. Yeah, I love I love that you're also involved in disc sports world because we are obviously Ultimate Frisbee podcast. We've we've dabbled in disc golf ourselves a little bit, um, but that's <laughs> that's great that you're you're in the community. Um, also, talking about like our, like our pre interview conversation that you had, you played D one soccer, and one of the the issues that we touched on wanting to talk about was were, like being injured and really wanting to get back to play possibly too quickly um, post an injury. And I think that's something that a lot of players, especially ultimate frisbee players, are going to experience after this pandemic. So, what do you ha- what advice do you have for these players who are dealing with injury, especially now after they've waited so long to play? Yeah, that's, it's a heavy topic, um, because everyone's different when they, when they have injuries and how quick they want to be back. I remember as an athlete, um, I had my injury in my, uh, freshman year. And, you know, as a, as a person that's, you know, you're trying to make a name for yourself in a program and you just want to be really good at what you do. And, and every athlete, uh, wants to do that. Uh, when you suffer an injury or a setback like that, there's all this pressure that you feel to come back. And, 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 and for that reason at the time, I didn't really, uh, I rushed it and I didn't do the proper, uh, training and, and the healing and the therapy that I needed to do to, to heal. It was my ankle. Um, and, and then I suffered for, for many months after that. So, so the, the biggest advice that I could give is to, um, is to rest and listen to your trainers and do your part to heal the injury. Um, but also, uh, the mental piece of the game is always something that can be worked on. Like we don't, you know, you don't have to just get rep, physical reps. You can get mental reps. You can visualize. You can, uh, start to create confidence in yourself. And, and those are things that you can do. Those are the controllables. Uh, so rest, listen to your, listen to your trainers and, and certainly start to see yourself being successful as an athlete are a few good tips. We are certainly no strangers to ankle injuries here on this podcast. <laughs> um, I I have an, a, a residual ankle injury from high school track, and Pockets had a formative <laughs> ankle injury in college. Um, and I I certainly yeah. did not ever really do like the whole mental piece of injury recovery. Granted, I could bounce back a lot quicker when I was like eighteen, but mm-hmm. now it's definitely. It's tougher trying to still be a part of a sport and not really be able to play. Well, I think so. And you know, one of the you know one of the things that all athletes uh, need is confidence. And when you suffer an injury, uh, confidence kind of you know for many gets lost. Uh, so you know, coming back after an injury and everyone else has been playing and training, uh, confidence takes a hit. So. You know, and that's a mental piece. It's an emotional piece of the game. So, um, so that's, you know, I would say that in this later stages of my life, I try to really be aware of the mental and emotional piece so that I can come back confident because uh, a, a confident player is a really effective player. Yeah, I think that's something that I struggled with after my injury. It happened at high tide where I'm wearing this shirt. <laughs> um, but it, it was because two, 
uh, me and this other girl collided and someone actually got a picture of it. I'm stepping on her ankle and you could just see mine ankle completely like caved in. Um, mm. But after, after that, I was – and got back to after I got back to play, I was so kind of scared to get on the field and be as physical on defense because I was like, oh, I don't know if I can get it because last time I messed up, last time I really injured myself, and that was like kind of a big detrimental part to my playing. Yeah, and there's a sport like a sports like component to that because it's kind of a trauma when you injure yourself in a in a game. There's a traumatic element to that, so it changes the way that you play when there's this fear of maybe re-injuring it or it's just a lack of confidence that you have. So um, I've seen, yeah, I've I've talked to many many athletes that have suffered sport related injuries, and there's you know trauma work that goes into those conversations when I'm one on one as a as a mental health counselor with those clients. So. Uh, it's certainly a big deal. And for every sport, there's a, you know, usually a contact element to it uh, and uh, it plays a role. Absolutely. Even with Frisbee being quote unquote non-contact, there's certainly plenty of it and plenty of injuries that come along with it. So um, yeah. we can totally come back to this if we have more relevant points, mm. but to steer the conversation a little bit, especially since Pockets brought up High Tide, which is a little bit of a, con- uh, not necessarily controversial, but it's a Definitely a an interesting point in like the the college frisbee career is uh, high tide is a spring break trip that we can do like as a team we go with our we go with, we go with our friends who are on the team um, a group of friends <laughs> to like to, it's to reduce liability with affiliation with the school and um, we go and we play for a week but of course when you're living in out of a basically an Airbnb hotel with um, like your own cooking setup and stuff with your 60 closest friends and you're playing Frisbee all day, but you're also in Myrtle beach. So you're drinking all night and um, that can definitely lead to some interesting social and mental issues with that. So that as kind of your foundation for Frisbee kind of being a party sport, (laughs) what, other advice would you have for people that are trying to do it all now that we're coming back from the pandemic? We haven't been able to see each other in 18 months. Um, and now we're uh, like, I'm, I'm, I know I'm trying to do it all. Um, so for anyone else out there that might be trying to hang out with all of their friends at once and maybe play Frisbee. Well, that's a hard balance, isn't it? And, uh, <laughs> and I think every, I think most sports too have this, uh, and maybe Frisbee a little more since it's, there's a culture of, of partying uh, involved. But, um, you know, what's that balance look like? And, you know, the, you know, if drinking is a part of the sport and, but you also want to be a competitive athlete, uh, I think you have to know your limits, like, and, and know, does drinking the night before, um, or does drinking while playing, like whatever it might be, uh, is that, <laughs> How does that hinder your performance? And what are your expectations and goals of going into a game that you play? Is it like, do you want to be at your best? Do you want to, are you looking to win? And does partying impact that negatively? And that's usually a, a question that most people have for themselves. And, you know, some people can drink a night before and, and feel like they can come out really good and, and others don't. And, um, and for some, it doesn't matter. They're going to party no matter what and come out however they come out. Um, but, uh, it's hard to know what that balance is. And to be honest with ourselves around how much, uh, partying impacts our performance. And, and sleep, sleep is one of the most important things that we can do for ourselves always. Like sleep is so important. And of course, partying impacts sleep to a degree. So, uh, I would have to, have to note that as well. All the above. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I know. I, I don't think I ever really drank before a real tournament, but I know personally I would sometimes overdo it because I would feel like the pressure to like fit in also. Um, to be like a part of a, a group where like a lot of people do drink a lot. And that's like a hard thing because it's like, it's very exhausting. I know I hit a wall actually last weekend, even just trying to see all my friends. And then I couldn't even go to fr- Frisbee because I was just so tired from like doing things every day. And that wasn't even drinking, but it's, mm-hmm. it's definitely been exhausting as a young adult as well, balancing it. Yeah, there's so many sports, right, where kind of partying is in the culture of the sport. And uh, and it does, you know, certainly impacts performance. So 
Um, you know, if every team and player is honest with themselves of what their expectations are and what they're looking to do, then, you know, you kind of set yourself up for the guidelines for, for that. Yeah. I imagine you have coaches, uh, to a degree, like people that kind of lead the team and, and, um, they either are initiating some of that action, I'm sure, or, <laughs> or looking to, um, kind of tone it down. What do you see mostly? Well, the, for college, at least every team will have captains. And I would say that's a little bit tougher because if you're a captain in college, you're also part of the team. And these are also your friends that you hang mm-hmm. out with all the time. So it's kind of hard to be like, hey, maybe we shouldn't drink as much the week before a tournament because it's like this is also like your friend group and you can't be the Debbie Downer because then it makes you feel bad. There's like this weird pressure. Um I don't know, but some, some, we had a coach and he was definitely, he was always telling, like, after I injured myself at high tide, he was like, Oh, you were drinking beer. You got dehydrated and now you're more <laughs> susceptible to injury. That is true. Um, <laughs> so mm-hmm. yeah, hard yeah. to balance. Mm-hmm. But I would say in like the college scene, it's like there's not, there's more pressure to, drink and party because you are we scotty and i have talked about this on previous episodes you're with all of those people who are also your friends also your roommates also your classmates teammates like you're doing everything together so there's like a lot of pressure to kind of and back to like balancing time and stuff it's just like you're pressured to do everything with these people but as you like grow up to club and scotty and i hurt like she's talked about her first season playing club, my first season playing club. We like playing with adults was so much fun. There was like less pressure mm-hmm. to do things. And I've seen that in club where people are encouraging each other like a little bit more to like take days off, take care of yourself. Um, so it's it's nice like growing up, kind of becoming adult a bit and seeing that in the culture. But it's still definitely there at all levels. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it is so hard to be honest with yourself. I definitely, (laughs) I struggle being honest with myself because I'm like, no, I can do it all. And then I don't have to sleep, right? I can just flex through it with coffee. That's not the case. Sleep when you're dead. Yeah. There's all of those good quotes out there uh, around the not not a need to rest. Um, But the research is getting so, so good in showing how important it is to rest. Uh, it needs to be a part of a part of the deal. Um, there was a, a watch or an app uh, that I've been into. I uh, haven't gotten the, the, the watch yet, uh, but it's a watch called Whoop, W-H-O-O-P, uh, which, which does a really good job of assessing uh, your sleep patterns, assessing nutrition, assessing your uh, heart rate variability and how much how uh, much you are performing at your optimal rate. And um, and the watch tells you when you've not done a good job. So um, it's a really good way to track your physical health and emotional health uh, so that you know how you're doing. For the people that's that are a little bit less conscious of how they're doing. No, that's that's really cool. I got a Fitbit not recently, yeah. a few months ago, and it tracks my sleep. It had it added like a stress management level recently, so it will rank my stress level throughout the day out of a hundred, and it bases it off of like sleep, my heart rate, how much I've exercised, if I've like over exercised or under exercised, and it's really it's re- it's cool, and I love it because I'm also a video game nerd, so I'm like, oh, how many steps have I done today? Have I reached my milestones? I, love, <laughs> I feel like I I'm I feel like I'm a player in a game. Making achievements. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. I didn't recognize. I didn't know that about you. Uh, I'm a I'm a gamer myself, so I appreciate that. Ooh. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to talk about that yeah, we'll get your, <laughs> later. 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 <laughs> Uh, maybe to segue away from this topic, but you <laughs> mentioned like sleep and rest before, which kind of plays into this. But you said your your specialty is kind of like in performance psychology, in mental performance. Um, can you talk more about like what you do, why mental performance is so important, and like how you help your patients with that? Yeah, sure, sure. So, so I can kind of go back to my days as an athlete as well, um, and. You know, as a soccer player, um, back in high school and, and going into college, I was supposed to be 
really good. I was supposed to be a player that was on a track to go play professional soccer. And that was kind of the, that was kind of the goal. And I had that in my head to a degree that I wanted to go do that. Um, and when I went to college in that first year, I, I was doing really well. And as a forward, I was scoring goals and that's what you want to do, obviously. So it was feeling good. I got injured at some point though. And, and for whatever reason, coming back from that, uh, my confidence struggled. I wasn't playing as much. And then, and then over my four years, I felt like I was just really inconsistent. And, and I knew that it wasn't my talent that was the problem. It was the mental and emotional piece that always was changing, depending on who I was coming out to play against, depending on whether I had a good or bad practice, uh, depending on just a, a random mood that hits you, uh, you, you come out and perform differently. And I was always very into why that was the case, but didn't really understand it. Or there wasn't a lot of knowledge. I'm 36 now. So you know, it's like 15 years ago when I was playing and, and there wasn't a lot of knowledge yet on sports psychology. At least it wasn't public. So I then learned more about my mind. I started meditation. I started understanding how our thinking and our emotional states impact things. And then I was like, oh, wow, like I have control of all of this and I can control, I control my confidence. I can control my performance. Now I've got to now I feel inspired to teach others about that. So, um, so really, there's this sense that I'm really interested in helping people be the best that they can be in whatever that they do, knowing that the mental and emotional is a piece for everybody. Um, so maybe that's a long way of saying how I kind of got into it, but um, I am pretty passionate about that subject because most people do struggle to a degree with understanding that piece of the game uh, or that piece of life. Absolutely. And it's great that you have such like a personal experience with it. And I do feel like that's part of our whole pitch for the podcast is just like, hey, we've been there. and We've been through these like weird, tough times. And it's like not knowing that you're not alone and also how you dealt with it and like the strategies that you can get through it. Obviously, you're a professional or just two girls with two microphones. <laughs> but I feel like your whole story embodies perfectly like our whole goal of the podcast as well. So um, definitely sharing those things that like, you know, you went through and you think you're struggling with alone. It was great. Do you have a recommendation for people that are like trying to work on their mental performance, like a starting point for them? Cause you, I know you mentioned meditation, but are, is there anything else? Well, there's, I think there's tons of good books and resources to start to understand those pieces. Um, meditation is, is a skill. It's like a training tool. And I, I kind of like in, uh, the skills of mental performance just to training, just as you would as a, as a, as a player. Like you, you go out and you spend hours working on things. And I'm sure as, as a, as ultimate frisbee players, you're working on, uh, and you'll help me with lingo, but you know, forehand throws, backhand throws, like, you know, like, like strategy and tactics and, and all of those things are part of your training. But, we don't necessarily work on the training of the mental and, and meditation is a training tool to do that. It helps you to understand your thoughts and how they, how they come through, how they impact, but things also like breathing to control anxiety and control stress. Um, just the idea of self talk. So you're thinking and changing how you think about things is really important. Um, and I mentioned visualization before, you know, those, those types of things are tools that allow you to think what you want to think so that you can feel what you want to feel, which allows you to perform. So it's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. They all come in line to get your results. Um, so those tools are really important. Goal setting, growth mindset, all those pieces are really important and uh, all are valuable. But there's a few good books that I certainly recommend. I think Mind, a book called Mind Gym was one of the first books I read on the subject which really was really helpful. Um, I can't remember the author's name off the top of my head, but that book was so su such an easy read that made that stress the importance of all of these different things. Uh, Mind Gym is at the top of the list. Um, and then every sport, I don't know about an Ultimate Frisbee uh, sports psych book yet, but there's uh, maybe you two could write it at some point. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to co-author it. We don't yes, know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't write very well. <laughs> you don't write well. I write pretty well, but I'm sure there's I'm sure there's psych fans, uh, psychology people that are that are an ultimate frisbee game, and it seems like there could be a need for uh, the mental performance piece of ultimate frisbee. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. So for all our listeners out there, if you are feeling like me in pockets right now and <laughs> mental health is, well, something that you need to continue to work on. I don't want to say all time low because I'm actually doing pretty good. Um, <laughs> this is for wrote all time low <laughs> and then finger guns. I literally wrote in the notes. If you're feeling like us and mental health is low right now. Finger guns. <laughs> finger guns especially at the beginning of the pandemic but now now i'm okay um <laughs> what what strategies what signs would you say that people out there need to recognize that your problems are real you know i think there's a lot of issues with like invalidating your own feelings your stresses your anxieties your depression how do you realize that that's a problem and like steps to take help because steps to get help because Obviously, like everyone's feelings are valid. Um, there's different degrees of like the ways everyone feels things. So I don't want to say like, you know, if, if you're at this degree, then you don't. But I think a lot of people invalidate their own feelings. And how do you recognize that but they're, they're real? Sure. This is a, you know, it's again, a complex question because there's so many different people feel those things differently and they, they talk through their own emotional states differently. Some, some feel them so strongly and they live within their emotions and they're, they, they guide them so much, uh, where others kind of deny them constantly. So there's, there, there's a huge range of how people think and feel. Um, but I would say that, uh, there always comes a point where simple anxiety becomes a problem. You know, anxiety is normal. We all should feel it, but there's time, there's a time when anxiety becomes too much. Uh, same thing for depression, where, you know, simple sadness is important for us and we should feel sadness sometimes. But at some point, uh, you know, that sadness goes on for too long and other symptoms start to occur with it. You know, people all probably uh, use substances at a level where they cause a little bit of harm to them from time to time. But there becomes a point where it becomes too much and, the, and those substances impact them more more negatively. So, you know, all of those different uh, disorders have this point where it becomes too much. And it's usually when it impacts their, their work or their school or their family life to a level where it's, it, there's a negative impact. Um, for every one of those disorders as well, there's a criteria of symptoms that you must meet to qualify for the diagnosis. Uh, for example, for just simple generalized anxiety, uh, there's, you must worry about something excessively for at least six months. Uh, and have some of those physical sensations too. Like we wouldn't call it diagnose, uh, we wouldn't diagnose anxiety until, uh, that's the case. Uh, for depression, the idea of sadness, well, you must feel it for two weeks, most days for two weeks, along with other eight, uh, five, six, seven other symptoms that would qualify someone. Maybe, uh, they're sleeping too much or too little, or they're eating too much or too little, or they have a feeling of guilt or, uh, worthlessness or hopelessness or they're fatigued. Like all of those things are pieces of, of the puzzle. Um, and I think it becomes an issue when those things are consistent and they impact their functioning in their daily lives. Uh, and that's the way that we diagnose, um, and for most people, therapy and going to a counselor is very helpful. Um, I always think that that's one of the first steps you should take is to, to talk to a professional. And usually that's, that does the trick, uh, to help. Uh, for some people, medication is also helpful to just get back to a set point and a baseline that's, that's helpful to them. I usually think of that as, as the second, you know, the second thing you'd want to go after, after just a therapist and, and that kind of work. Uh, but yeah, that's, you know, there's, I'm glad that mental health is at a place where the stigma of it is lessening. People feel like they're like, everyone knows plenty of people. There's probably after this pandemic or during, there's got to be 30 to 40 to 50% of people that struggle with some sort of mental health piece. It was really tough on a lot of people. So um, it's becoming more normal and the strategies to deal with it has become more normalized as well. Absolutely. And definitely grateful that we can talk about it a lot more openly, even though 
yeah, like a couple, like you said, a couple of years ago, it was not, it was very taboo. Well, I think that um, if they would have been, I think my struggles in college, I, you know, I don't, I haven't talked about it too much either, but um, you know, I mentioned this difficulty in soccer, but it was also that I probably would have been diagnosed with some social anxiety at that time. Like it was, it was tough for me to, um, I cared a lot about judgment and criticism, criticism from others. I was definitely a very introverted. I was to myself. I cared about what other people thought and I worried about putting myself in a spot where other people could judge. And that's, you know, that's, I worried about it a lot. So that's the, you know, that's a, the highlight of social anxiety. So I, I certainly probably had that as a high school kid and college kid. And, uh, I wish, and I never knew it. I wish that there was more information then on, on those things. Cause I, if I would have known that that was what I was kind of struggling with, I would have known that there was also solutions and, and treatment available, which I didn't realize at the time. Yeah. I feel like a lot of college kids, especially since that's such a strong transition in your life, they suddenly feel like an overwhelming wave of emotion. And then a lot of the times I feel like they don't talk about it with their friends and they don't talk about it with anyone. Cause I feel like a lot of the time they're told like, Oh, like you're transitioning. It's you're supposed to feel like this. And I know you brought up like, um, like we're supposed to sometimes feel sadness. We're supposed to sometimes feel some anxiety. Um, and my, my therapist actually, she kind of describes it as like a heartbeat where you should have ups and downs. Cause if it's all flat, you don't, you don't want a flat line. <laughs> <and it is. laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I would like more people cause I know I felt overwhelmed starting college, a bit of like social anxiety, like you said. Um, I wish like I talked to more people about it cause I feel like I would have solved some of my issues a lot earlier on. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely had it. I definitely had a lot of social anxiety, which always confused me because I'm very extroverted. I'm very friendly. I love to meet new people, but I don't know if that's necessarily me seeking like validation from them rather than like actually making friends. And it was always interesting because I felt like that's what contributed so much to like me partying too much in college was that like I always, I didn't want to miss out on a social event. So I went to too many and that type of thing, you know, obviously impacts everything (laughs) it's all connected but it's just interesting like i never i i've you know we've talked about my therapist a little bit because she's our connection to pal but um (laughs) (laughs) uh, it's just like that's something that like i never really like put together because it was like i don't know maybe i didn't even admit it to her that that's how i felt because like a lot of that is you know being honest with yourself as well that's a really good insight though yeah i love is that, a, is, that, is that a new insight or you've known that for a while? That's really good. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's making breakthroughs here on the Laying It Out podcast. <laughs> um, what we do, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just very interesting that like how those things connect. And I do wish like I could have talked about it with friends, but I think everyone's struggling in their same way. So being able to like be honest and not pulling one of those classic, like, are you mad at me? Like, are we friends? Or are you just acting like we're friends? Like type of things. It helps a lot. And it, and it brings me to another, it brings me to another point of how yes. friends usually respond because it's, uh, I have found that, that certainly in this, you know, in this, you know, at your age, you all have grown up, you know, <laughs> feel like I can now say that I feel that old uh, being, you know, 15 years older, maybe, but, um, but it, but you all have grown up with, with technology and, and the ability to communicate through phone and, and texting. And it certainly has changed the way we interact with each other and find that people are, uh, maybe they're, they struggle a little bit more with listening. And I think friends, friends could do a better job listening to each other. You know, if you were to go share something with someone, uh, the friends usually have a way of either telling you what they think you should do, like a solution, or they should, or they just turn it into their own story about how they're impacted about something. And, um, I think that I, I wish people would just have some better skills of listening, of being interested in what someone says, having, showing empathy, um, asking questions about how they're do- doing with it and trying not to ch- like shove it off and say, Oh, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Well, it's okay to not be fine. Sometimes we just want to be heard and being a good listener allows that to happen. Um, and it makes us better friends as well. 
I think my best way for handling that, because I was a terrible listener when I graduated <laughs> high school, my twin sister will still make fun of me for the fact that I failed a health class quiz about like, are you a good listener? And I did so poorly that I was off the charts. And Julia, my, my twin sister was like, you are, yeah, of course you are. Everyone knows that. So I've been working on it. And I found that one way is I always ask, I tell people, oh, I just need to vent. I just need to be heard. You don't need to solve it. You don't need to offer me advice. Like I just need to say this and then we can like move on. And the mm -hmm. same thing I always ask people, like, do you just need to be heard or do you actually want advice? And I think that that has improved my relationships a lot. Great question. Yeah, great question. All right. So in terms of other questions, um, do you have anything else that we wanted to touch on before uh, we uh, wrap up? You know, one of the things I'm very, I am very into is just well-being. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time focused on mental illness, which, you know, rightfully so, because a lot of people struggle with that. Um, but in my opinion, we don't often spend enough time focused on well-being and happiness and the things that that allow us to do that and allow us to to be well um, there's a branch of psychology called positive psychology which is just the study of well-being and happiness and and that research has been going on for 25 years now of those things that that have been researched to uh to define what makes people happy and have meaning in their life and feel positive emotion and be engaged in their work and have good relationships. So all of that research is there. Um, I would say that, that there was an acronym developed. Yeah, I think it's a funny word, which is catchy. And the acronym is SNRM. Uh, <laughs> so, SNRM, uh, which is S N E R M, uh, SNRM. And I can't stop saying it because it's a funny word. So especially for the kids I work with, it's all we're SNRMing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the the S in SNRM is sleep and and how important sleep is. Uh, the N is nutrition. Uh, food is so important to to how we respond to all things, but certainly our mental and emotional lives are very impacted by our nutrition. Um, and beer, I wonder how much beer impacts impacts that. <laughs> um, big eyes there. Uh, exercise is the E. Uh, having good relationships is the R and mindfulness, uh, trying to, to, uh, purposefully be more in the present moment is the M. So I love that acronym of SNRM because those are those qualities that really do help us to be well. Uh, but simple things like gratitude, uh, kindness, focusing on our strengths. Those are, those are simple, simple things that, that really do increase our level of well being, which allows us to perform better at whatever we do. Uh, so I, I wish that more of that that topic was promoted rather than just the things that that we struggle with. Uh, that's kind of my purpose. Uh, I agree. I think that like celebrating, like recovering, like well being, and just being happy is such something that we totally look over because I think a lot of times you know either people are struggling, and you're like, hey, I'm doing great, and people say, hey, isn't that great for you? Like great, you know, like but like sarcastically. I did not uh -huh. give the intonation for that correctly. But, you know, the other day I was like sitting and having dinner with my roommate. And we were talking about like how right now we were both like so happy and relaxed and she's going away this weekend and I'm going to be home alone. And I'm like amped for it because I'm like, <laughs> I actually enjoy hanging out with myself and I am like not stressed out about anything. And like, I have a bunch of things to look forward to. And I think that that is something that like she was totally amped to celebrate with me and uh, she also is like doing really great also. So we were like, you know what? Like, this is good. Like we're happy and like celebrating like how good you're doing is totally valid. <laughs> and that's great. Yeah, that's great. We can dive in also to the people that when they are feeling good, they that gets them uncomfortable. Uh, it's uncomfortable for them to feel good because they always want to be working on something or they've identified with being unhappy or they've identified with being anxious. And it's, you know, there's a fear there of it going away, their happiness and success going away. So then they purposely kind of sabotage it so that they don't get there. And because it's comfortable to not feel well, they've known that. Um, so it's, it's an interesting dynamic that comes with well-being and happiness. Um, and I, and yes, you said it well, I wish that more people would, uh, celebrate those things rather than avoid them or think that they're not possible. They definitely are. Yeah. This yeah. might be a more 
personal for me question, but I've definitely been trying to work on my own wellness, especially since the pandemic. And I have so much time by myself. And like Scotty said, she's happy being by herself. That's something I'm trying to work on. But what advice do you have for people that are like working for that wellness, but kind of have like a, a setback? Because I've always find like, I have to be doing everything at once. So hit all the s- snurms, hit everyone at once. And then if I, <laughs> if I miss one of them... <laughs> If I miss one of them, I feel so like let down on myself. Hmm. So, and again, that advice comes, you know, advice comes very specific to different people. Um, But uh, I'm hearing a little bit of this quality of perfectionism in that of, you know, how much you, you mentioned you need to hit all of those things. So yeah, if you're, if your sleep and nutrition and your relationships are good and you're trying to spend time on the things that are important to you, if I'll just include that into the mindfulness piece. Uh, but you haven't been exercising in a couple of days. And so you really get down on yourself because you haven't been doing that. Um, well, then we, you know, being easy and having compassion and, and just kindness for ourselves is so important too, to know that we don't have to be perfect all the time. Um, I've tried to do that myself recently too, of, of, you know, I'm very busy and I've got a lot of things going on. And when I like, when I have an hour to rest and then I do it, sometimes I feel guilty that I'm taking that hour to go rest or a, cause I'd rather, cause I could be doing other things that are, that are good for my work. So to be easy on ourselves, uh, easier said than done is, is really important. Um, but I think that what could help with that is also setting up goals and setting up the things that you would like to accomplish or achieve in a week or in a day and, um, and sticking to that and knowing that you don't have to do the hundred things, but you have to do those three to five things that you set out to do in your week. And that's what you consider to be successful for yourself. Um, and it kind of reigns in this all encompassing attitude towards all of those things that we need to do. I like that. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Being easy on ourselves kind of comes to the the point of it all. Um, I like that. I think, (laughs) yeah, I I think that's a good note to ask. Uh, So do you have any personal projects or things that you can plug on the podcast before we sign off? Sure. Sure. I, uh, I, you know, I've been, I'm a, you know, a therapist and, and a mental health clinician. And I've been doing that now for six or seven years, but I've been in a school. I've been in a private practice and I've been a teacher. And that's, that's kind of what I've been doing, but it's been focused on the mental illness piece of things. That's what, that's what I've done. Um, however, for the last couple of years, I've been seeing a lot of athletes and performers, uh, and just what we talked about today to, to help them understand, manage and train the mind so that they can more consistently perform. Uh, this summer, I'm going live with that business uh, and I'm doing workshops. I am uh, working with teams and individuals. And that's all that's all right out right out the gate here in summer. So uh, there's a website that I actually will be going live in the next day. Uh, and that is uh, called it's called Positively Elite, and that's the name of my business. So it's www.positivelyelite.com. And by the time this episode airs, it should be live. Um, if anyone has any questions uh, or, or concerns or they would like to meet to talk about some of those things or to do one of the workshops I have this August, uh, you can visit that website and contact me through there. And that would be great. Very cool. We'll definitely be tweeting it and including it in the podcast description for any of our listeners. Um, so that way you guys know how to contact Powell and maybe have a break through my pockets as, like we did today. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, with all that said, thanks so much for joining us. This was such a fun and valuable conversation that uh, I'm glad that we were able to get connected to have. Yeah. Thank you both for having me on. All right. And with that, uh, listeners, we will cut to an ad break and then we'll be right back to wrap it up and make sure that you catch us in the PS zone for some more random Pockets and Scotty mental health conversation. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Thanks again, pal. Thanks. Thanks again, pal, for such an introspective and interesting interview. 
I certainly learned a lot and it seems like Pockets got a lot of her questions answered. We hope you guys yes. did too. If you are interested, feel free to check out his website, Positively Elite, which we will be plugging in the description of this episode. Um, and we'll also be tweeting it out if you follow us on Twitter, laying it out with all underscores. Um, Pockets got anything else to share? Will we wrap nothing up? A, nothing about the um, interview. I thought it was great, like you said. I had a really good time talking to him. Scotty and I were, were talking afterwards. We're like, oh, I feel like we're getting like a lot better at interviews here. But maybe that's for the listeners to say. We do have the PS Zone coming up after this to kind of combine me moving to a new house and the idea of mental health. And that conversation that we had earlier in the episode, Scotty and I are just going to have a little chit chat about how we have found that your physical space, especially your bedroom, kind of can affect your mental health. And then maybe if you have some decorating tips for me, let me know. But yeah, subscribers, listen in. If you're not subscribed, definitely subscribe to Ulti World and come on down to the <laughs> PS Zone where we have a good time every time. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and for now, if you can't get enough of us, we're a little bit bad about posting on Instagram, but that's at laying it out with a period between each word. Twitter is laying underscore it underscore out. And we're both on Twitter as well. Uh, finally, you can email us if you're really that interested, <laughs> uh, laying it out at ultiworld.com. You know, if you Google it, all the info is there. Um, <laughs> if you Google it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure if you Google it, we'll just pop up on Twitter. If you Google <laughs> Scotty, she pops up. But I think if you Google Pockets, it does not because I'm an actual object. <laughs> anyway, internet personalities aside, um, thanks so much for tuning in. And we'll see you again in two weeks. And for now, I've been Scotty Dempsey. I've been Chelsea Pockets. And we'll catch you on the flip. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> right as it. <laughs>